I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, maybe about 40 minutes. And then we'll take questions for as long as uh, we can, as long as we have questions. Uh, uh, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I also wanted uh, to, to pivot just a little bit and remind people that there was a, an earthquake in Izmir this morning that, um, uh, that resulted in, in maybe 20 buildings collapsing. And I wanted to ask the audience to keep the people of Izmir in their thoughts. Uh, I was talking to my friends there and they are all okay. But um, if, you took, if you look at the images on the internet um, uh, or some of the videos, they are quite harrowing. So I just wanted to, um, again, ask you to keep them in their thoughts. And um, yes, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, that is always exciting. Let's see. Let's see how the sharing of the screen happens. Uh, and uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a list of thanks of many people who have made this project come to come alive. And that is um, uh, here we are right here. Here we are right here sharing the screen. And and I'm gonna go right here. And uh, let's see right here. So. So this, this project is uh, about six years in the making and it is the, the it has been the, um, the, the, the creation or the, the collaboration of many, many different people. So uh, first I wanna thank Julie Ellison Spate and Ann Betteridge uh, here at the University of Arizona. I wanna thank Mustafa Olpak and his uh, daughter Zainab uh, I want to th uh, thank uh, Behu Behan Turkulu, who has served as as the, the primary translator. She was the person that kind of helped me through uh, getting helped me through Izmir and, and and introducing me to many many people. Uh, and the person that was working with her, Lulifer Karukmez, um, she was uh, an assistant to Mustafa for a long time. Uh, the president of the Afro Turks Association is is Sharkir Douler. And, um, and he worked with Ehud Toledanu, and I'm gonna talk a lot about Ehud's work and Hakan Erdem's work. Uh, and right on the ground, I hope to see her again very soon, Rashida Mullings. And uh, she's currently uh, living in Turkey and she lives in Mula, where there are more Afro-Turks that I would like to talk to. The first round of this discussion, uh, uh, the first round of, of the translation was uh, was translated by Rabia Harmanta, and the second round was translated by my students at the uh, uh, Ege University, the, the faculty or the Department of American Literature and Culture. So I just want to I just want to introduce them all to you. This is one of the things that we'll be talking about at the end of the lecture. But I I recently looked at this. Photograph and I and I uh, and my eyes watered up a little bit because I because we sure we really did have good times. So uh, starting right here, this is one of the cameramen, Tuna. Uh, this is the first um, interviewer, Almala. Uh, this is the second cameraman, uh, Sh Shadi. Uh, this is Sirhan. He was an interviewer. This is Mezure. Uh, Mezure and Sharkir, our brother and sister. This is Sharkir and Mezure, and she was the on-air talent, the subject. This is Ayla, and she is a working journalist in Istanbul now. Gulten was another interviewer and a camera person. She operated the camera. And Ur, Ur was uh, both camera and interviewer. And I know it makes it sound fancy. Like, you know, look at all my camera people. What we did was hold up our iPhones and use different, uh, selfie sticks to to and be coordinated with each other but that that was our our second interview and that was one of our um one of my most um, uh, fondest memories i just realized right here i didn't put a name on her but this is this is behan again this is behan and we're going to see a different picture of behan right here so i just want to say thank you to all of them and i'm going to send them this video link um so so it's, uh, yeah, all right, I gotta move on or I'm gonna start crying. So, all right, all right, all right. So I'm gonna talk to you. 
Uh, give you give you this in about five points. Talk about Afro Turks and Afro consciousness and African or Black consciousness. Um, I should probably start off by just saying, well, what is it that we're really talking about? Uh, Mustafa Olpak uh, wrote a memoir that was published in Turkey in 2005. And he opens up his memoir by saying that he is one of, he's the first person from his generation who will freely admit that he is of African heritage. And he said, nobody else is gonna do it, but he had to do it because he had to break the wall of silence. And that makes, and that puts him in a very special position. And, and that, that made this conversation automatically, not about Turkey, but about the African diaspora. And, and so basically he, uh, Mustafa, or Mustafa, Mustafa's uh, uh, memoir, which I have right here, it's pronounced Kolekeyeza, uh, uh, and, um, and it means it's a sort of a, a family and, and, um, and island. Uh, and, and, but it's mostly, but it's about from Kenya to Istanbul to Crete, or Kenya, Crete, Istanbul. Uh, uh, is the full title of it. And it's about his family's history, uh, his mother's parents and their parents and their history as enslaved people. I wanna say that I will probably switch back and forth between the two words enslaved and slave. I prefer to use the word enslaved, but uh, sometimes I, I'm not particularly mindful of it. So sometimes I use the word slave, but really I'm talking about people who had a condition put on them. And so getting back to what Mustafa was writing about, he, he said uh, in his memoir that essentially his family is the descendants of slaves. And uh, that's probably the most important reason why you should read this, this memoir, uh, because he places his family at the center of the story. He doesn't talk about sultans and he doesn't talk about presidents and prime ministers. He talks about how his family experienced all of these changes. And, um, and what I found when I did many of my interviews and stayed in Turkey was that the Afro-Turkish people, then these are people who are the descendants of enslaved people in the Ottoman Empire, that they are people who think of themselves as Turkish first, and Muslim second and black third. And they're proud of all of these things, but it's not, these things aren't necessarily fixed. Um, I think the thing that they're proudest of is being Turkish, but, they're, but there's a great deal of conflict with them about uh, the way in which they think about blackness. And we'll get to that in a second. So, so it's important to know that race is fluid in Turkey. And much of it has to do with the fact that the census doesn't record race. It uh, doesn't ask you uh, like it does in the United States. Like, are you black? Are you are you um, Hispanic? Are you non-Hispanic white? And so forth. Uh, in Turkey, I uh, I don't I know that they don't do that. Um, in fact, um, there's this real belief in Turkey that there's just one race and one nation. There's the Turkish nation, and there is the Turkish race. Uh, but that's that's the big idea. The smaller idea is that when you start asking different people, different groups of people, how do they identify? That's when the issue of race comes up. So, so let's get to this first question. And uh, this question that I, I, I wanna say is not asked in judgment. Uh, why is it difficult to talk about slavery in modern Turkey? Uh, because, and the answer is this, when you acknowledge the presence of the Afro-Turks as the, the descendants of enslaved people, that means you acknowledge the presence of slavery. And so when I would ask people in Turkey, when I was in Turkey, I would say, hey, you know, do you know about the Afro Turks or have you heard, read about the Afro Turks? I get one of five answers. Uh, answer number one is, what? The Ottoman Empire had slavery? I had no idea. Okay. Then the second is, uh, yeah, the Ottoman Empire had slavery, but it was governed by Sharia law. And Sharia law is nowhere as bad as American slavery. Uh, third answer is, it's the Greeks who did it. It wasn't the Turkish people who did this. All right. 
uh, then, the, then the other answer is uh, everybody suffered, everybody was poor, what's the big problem? Uh, this brings me to my first point, which is that one of the things that slavery does is that it, def it, it deprives people of a state or a country to call their own. That meant that being enslaved uh, was for OPAC's family is that they worked for the Ottoman Empire, they lived under the Ottoman Empire, they bore their, their children under the Ottoman Empire, and yet they could not claim citizenship in the Ottoman Empire. And I thought about that and I thought about how that makes the Afro-Turks, uh, or at least their, their uh, background, I thought that, ma that made them citizens without a state. But then I, I didn't want to go uh, too negative. So I think I wanted to say that they are transnational citizens. They are people that exist and are citizens of something. But in the case of the Afro-Turks, their citizenship is shifting. So that's probably the first thing that I wanted to uh, point out to you is that, is that when you talk about slavery, uh, you have to talk about the issue of citizenship. And that's from, in many ways, is why it's so difficult for people to talk about slavery now. Not, not so much because slavery is shameful, but it's this question of, well, who, who is a citizen of this country and who isn't? All right, let's go to the next slide uh, and see right here. I know that these, oh, here it is right here. All right, all right. So what makes, it, what makes this crazy? What makes this difficult? Is that um, slavery in the Ottoman Empire and, uh, uh, and citizenship in the in the Turkish Republic, it is um, it's it's a complex discussion. But one of the things that's really interesting is that the Afro Turks, um, in many ways, have been in the Ottoman Empire and in Turkey for longer than many families, many so-called white families. Uh, that uh, the, but here are the specific details. Uh, the the details are that uh, slavery in no the the, the details are that. The, the slave trade in Africa for the Ottoman Empire begins around 1800, a little bit before, a little bit after. Um, it's not, that's not the point. The point is not so much the, the, the specific times, it's the how many people. Uh, Michael Ferguson, who was on last week, and Ehu Toledano, Toledano, Ehu Toledano, have found estimates that put about 1.3 million people from Africa alone, East Africa, North Africa, so forth. They are traded into the Ottoman Empire. Um, and Eve Trout Powell has done a great deal of work on this as well, particularly on women. So what I have here are just kind of two slides, just because historians love slides and, and, and they love maps. And so I just said, okay, well, here's, here's the, ex the, the expanse of the Ottoman Empire. And here are some of the places where the slave trade emerged. And, and we can see these trading routes. As a scholar of African-American history, I am familiar with the Atlantic side. But one of the things that I'm really getting interested in is the Eastern side, the East slavery on in the Eastern Atlantic and how that feeds the Ottoman Empire. All right, so we know this. So the slave trade goes from about 1800 and slavery is not abolished until 1923. It starts to trickle to an end around 1909, 1910, but it's still on the books, as we would say, uh, in, in 1923. So, so Africans are enslaved in the Ottoman Empire for about 120, give or take, years. And then the question becomes, what's gonna happen to these people who are not citizens? Uh, and how are they going to be intertwined or drawn into the Turkish Republic? Uh, my map here uh, speaks to one of the singular moments in, uh, in uh, uh, tur modern Turkish history, and that is the, the Treaty of Population Exchange. And I have another slide that's going to that's gonna lay this out, but I just wanted to put that, that, uh, that this Treaty of Population Exchange is one of the, it's one of the defining moments because it really defines, again, who is a citizen and who is not. But to get back to the numbers, just for a second. Uh, so Ehud Toledano, Toledano and Michael Ferguson say about 1.3 million people. Scholar Madeline Zilfi 
says that of that 1.3 million Africans who are enslaved, about two thirds of them are women. So about 800,000 women. And what all of these arrows are pointing to right here is this, the, 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 the middle passage for the Eastern side of the slave trade is, uh, is gonna go through the Sahara Desert. And then up through, I'm gonna go right here. Uh, and then up through the Sahara Desert and then up through Northern Africa. And some of the major tra uh, trading ports are Benghazi and Tripoli and, others, and other areas. And so what's gonna happen is that people who are captured and enslaved, they're gonna primarily be uh, enslaved in what was part of the M Ottoman Empire, Greece. But as we know, as we know, there is a war for independence between Greece and Turkey between 1919 and 1923. Let's get to the let's get to some of the hard uh, uh, some of the other facts or the or the data. All right, and and that leads me to my third point, which is that uh, the Turkish Republic also has a complex relationship with emancipation. And, and that is, that's going to be one of the key differences between American slavery and Turkish slavery. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm going to have to look out for. So, so what, so these are some of the things that happen. We have the fall of the Ottoman Empire, you know, end of World War I. And that's in 19, 1918, 1919. And then we have the Turkish War of Independence, uh, uh, in which, uh, Turk, the, the, the primary, the primary, uh, uh, a rival is going to be Greece, and that's going to go for four years. And then we have the election of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in 1923. And then most most importantly, this we're going to have the Treaty of Population Exchange. And what that really means for us is that all of those enslaved Africans, most of them women, who were enslaved and living in Greece, are now going to be set free and uh, they are going to move to Turkey. That was the big deal with the Treaty of Population Exchange. All people of Turkish citizenship, but living in Greece or Ottoman citizenship or living in Greece are gonna go to Turkey. All people of Greek citizenship, but living in Turkey are gonna go, to, go back to Greece. And what happens? What's gonna happen to the slaves? That's, that's the story. I mean, that's part of the story. So, let me give you an example of that. Um, Mustafa Olpak's mother, Kamala, uh, she, was a, she was born in 1923 and she was just a tiny baby when the Treaty of Population Exchange was, was, was decided. And what happens is that her parents were enslaved and living and working for a family in Greece. The master of that of that of that family, the master, the the, the slave owner, uh, sets the family free. Says, "All right, I I set you free." What he doesn't do, so he grants them he grants them emancipation or manumission, but he what he doesn't do is give them reparations, which evidently is required by Sharia law. But people don't have any money, so Mustafa Olpak's maternal grandparents are set free, but they don't have any money, they don't have any property, and they don't have anything to trade. And they're on the Greek islands. They're in the Greek islands, 1923. Kamala, uh, little baby, little baby, she doesn't have a name yet, um, is maybe one or two months old. So what does the family do? The family uh, decides uh, as a group that they're going to leave uh, uh, Crete, or, or the, yeah, they're gonna leave these Greek islands, and they're going to go to the western coast of Turkey, the Aegean. They're going to try to find a. The, uh, they're going to just they're just going to go. So they go, meaning they're going to get on the boat and sort it out once they get to where they're going. So there, there was a ferry that goes from Crete to Izmir or Smyrna at the time. And here's the point: you got a you got a, a a black family. They are formerly slaves, but they don't have any money and they don't have any land and they don't have anything to trade with. And they've just decided, and they got to go. They they are people who are uh, who are considered citizens of somewhere, uh, but they're not quite Greek and they're not quite Turkish. Uh, but they said they said, you know what? We're going to get on this boat. So they literally they get on the boat, and, and the point is is that 
little Kamala is like uh, one month old, two month old, and they didn't have any money, the family, so they didn't buy any tickets. Uh, they don't have any money to buy tickets. So they just decide they're just gonna get on the boat and sort it out. Uh, and they rush onto the boat. There are, men, there are thousands of people trying to get onto the ferry, uh, hundreds of people trying to get onto the ferry and they just sort of push their way on. And the way that they hide Kamala is to wrap her in a carpet or a Turkish rug, uh, both to keep her warm and to keep her quiet. And so the mother, Shadia, has her little baby Kamala in her arms and they just in the who's wrapped in the Turkish rug and it looks like she's a carpet, you know, she's just carrying this expensive carpet. No, she's carrying her baby, who's even more valuable, of course, than the, than the carpet. And so, and she, uh, and they all get on together. And that's how his family moves from being in Crete to being in Turkey or being specifically in Ivory. So here's, here is the, um, here's how it, here's how it shakes down. Here we are. This is a big, this is a lot. You, uh, uh, when you buy the book or, or, or when we have a discussion about it, um, uh, we can go through it. But basically, here's, here's how it works. And there's more members of the family. And that, it took me a while to sort of sort out uh, where um, everybody fits. But basically, Kamala is named after Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Uh, and so she, uh, she, uh, She's sort of the first resident, the first citizen of Turkey in this family. Ahmet, or Corson Ahmet, uh, meaning Ahmet the pirate, um, is the father. Shadia is the mother. And then there are sons and daughters. There are or, 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 uh, other relations. Shadia has a sister named Tetanuria. And Tetanuria had been sold away from the family. And she was given a uh, she was told that she can only take one person with her. And so she takes her daughter, Elmas, with her to, uh, to Istanbul. Nuria is her younger daughter. Uh, uh, and Nuria is, sell, is sold, into, uh, sold away from the family and uh, works as, as an indentured servant. And so does Zeynep. So these are all the different members of the, of the Afro-Turks. There are all these different sort of moving parts that... Um, that uh um that Mustafa Olpak has is trying to sort out. So let's um let's go to that point. So so uh, so so we have three points so far. Number one, we have all these people who are citizens without a state. They are they are they are enslaved people, and they're part of the Ottoman Empire and they're part of the Turkish Republic. Um, and so, so and I prefer to call them transnational citizens. Uh, and then there's a set that second point, which is that the Ottoman Empire is really quite complex when it, when it comes to slavery uh, and in terms of how it's governed. Uh, some people keep records, some people don't keep records. Some people uh, allow people to run away and, or people run away and never chase after them. Some people uh, really send, send out uh, uh, gu guards and police officers or whatever and, and, and chase after people and bring them back. It's really quite complex. And then there's that third point, which is that now that these people these enslaved, these formerly enslaved people, now that they are in Turkey, like who are they gonna be? That's that, that's the complexity. So here's, here's the thing that I would say. Um, history is about people. Um, history can be about uh, dates. It can be about organizations. It can be about big actors and History can be about land, but I think the reason why people read history is that it's about people. So we're gonna look at this picture and this picture right here is of Kemala Opak. And this is Mustafa's mother. And this picture is in his, um, right here in his, uh, in his uh, book. Uh, and, and they had, and Kamala and Mehmet, uh, had nine children. What's interesting, now that I remember, is that uh, there are no pictures, to my recollection, there are no pictures of Mehmet, his father, in this in his in his memoir. There are many pictures of his mother, and I think that that really kind of speaks to how closely uh, Mustafa was to his mother. He really, I, I think, he dedicates. 
uh, the memoir to his mother and the work that they did, uh, the, the, uh, the work that she did to keep her family together. There are um, many kind of uh, harrowing stories in the memoir. Uh, and I think that one of the most heartbreaking parts about Opak's story is the shame that his family members kept in their hearts when they talked about who they were and where they came from. Uh, that they talked with, they talked about slavery um, as if it was somehow their fault or that it was the fault of their ancestors. Or they talked about themselves, uh, according to Mr. Opak, as if they were, they had done something wrong. And I want to put here in parentheses that in the field of Black studies, uh, that idea that slavery is something that is the fault of the victim, that, that is thoroughly dispelled on day one. Uh, that slavery is something that is a state that it has been imposed on people, but it's not a shame or a weight that people should have. That type of idea, that type of consciousness um, uh, is something that is still, uh, still the, the Afro Turks are still uh, are working through. Hold on. So I want to tell, I want to say that that um, what keeps the family together, uh, all nine of them, is their love. They're, they deeply loved each other and they were deeply bonded to each other. But what kept them in poverty? Uh, uh, what well. What, what, what they carried in their hearts or what they carried in their family legacy that they're still trying to work out is um, the impact of slavery uh, on, on their lives. Um, and, so, and so I just wanna say that Kamala and Mehmet, uh, they had nine children, as you can see, and we're gonna see one of them. Well, we know one of them is Mustafa and the other one is, uh, is the oldest, uh, Saadi. Uh, this family is really, that, that's kind of the crux of the story. They went through a great deal. Uh, at one point, the, the mother has run out of money and she has seven children and she has to live in the forest. Like she literally has to live in an, in, in an ab abandoned property in the forest because, uh, because, because she just doesn't have any enough, enough money to, to rent out a house. And uh, that's one of the things that drew me to Izmir for my uh, second Fulbright. And that was to really look at where Mustafa lived and how did he navigate uh, the, how did he navigate living in, in Izmir? So here are, here are some of the um, key themes. Um, one of the things that I thought comes out a lot in the, um, in, in the book is how uh, freedom, uh, liberation meant freedom. And how, and how the family is constantly struggling with the choices that they have made. I don't think it's revealing anything to say this right at, right at the beginning, which is that um, it's an example of the freedom of choice is that uh, Mustafa's, Mustafa Opak, his, uh, his great aunt is, uh, I'm gonna go back and, and, and tell you this. Okay, yes, right here, it, it helps me, uh, or I think it, it might help you. So, uh, Tete Nourie is his, uh, is his great aunt. She is the sister of his grandmother, Shadie. What we'll find out very early in the memoir is that Tete Nourie was married to her stepson. Uh, her, her first husband was Ibrahim. Ibrahim and Tete Nourie and Shadia and Shemdia were, at, were kidnapped as a, as a family unit in uh, Central Africa and, and, and they were brought into the slave trade and they were sold together as a family unit uh, as they were, and, and, they, and they make their lives or they try to make a life for themselves in Crete. Tete Nourier's first husband, Ibrahim, dies uh, in Crete and the masters compel Tete Nourie to marry her stepson, Ahmet, or course on Ahmet. Ahmet is Ibrahim's son from a previous marriage. So the great aunt, or 
Tetanurier has to marry Amit, and the two of them uh, uh, would hold that. They, they were very, very angry with each other uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, Tetanurier was, I think, I think at least 10 years older, maybe more than Amit. But at, but at some point, um, I think that they have two children, which is Zeynep and Nurie. Then Teta Nurie is sold away to work in Istanbul. And she takes her daughter, I think another daughter, Elmas, with her. So the masters do another uh, uh, thing. And they force Corson Ahmet, or Ahmet the pirate, they force Ahmet to marry Teta Nurie's sister, Shadia. And that, if uh, the two of them, the two of them, uh, uh, though they, though they reconciled, when I say they, meaning Teta Nurie and Shadia, they did find a way through it. She, Teta Nurie and Ahmet never forgave each other for that. And to go back to that point then, uh, as I go through that, oh, excuse me, is, is that um, one of the things that comes together in this, in this uh, discussion is how their choices were taken away from them. Uh, their choice to, to marry who they wanted to, their choice to live where they wanted to, their choice to have the job that they wanted to. That is an idea that is going to follow the entire family. What does liberation mean if, if nothing is guaranteed with that liberation? That is going to follow the, the entire family throughout the 20th century. This is a picture of, of, of Saadi, and Saadi is... Uh, the oldest child of Kamala and Mehmet. So, so, and he carried a lot of shame too. And I'm going to skip right here and say that one of the things that really troubled this entire family was alcoholism, that many of the, that, that I think uh, at least three members of the family succumbed to alcoholism uh, at different points and how that is also a source of shame. Um, and yet, uh, I want to circle here and say that Education, particularly the education of, of the younger members of the family, that was key to, that was key, that was important for, uh, for Kamala Opak, uh, so that she had not gotten very much education when she, when she was a girl. She maybe had second, two or three years of education, and she wanted her children to have a lot more. Uh, and it's uh, uh, finally, in terms of the big, the big picture, uh, Mustafa Opak was very much involved in uh, leftist politics. He was, uh, what, what type of work did he do? He was a Mason, he was a stonemason for a long time. And uh, this was in the 70s and 1980s. And uh, the people at the, at the masonry, at the, at the, uh, at, at where, the places where you gather marble, uh, had told him, hey, you know, you gotta be quiet about your politics. You know, this job is really good. Uh, it pays a lot of benefits, and and if you are um, if you are outspoken about your politics, then something bad is going to happen to you. And in fact, something bad did did happen to him. If you know Turkish history, or as my students like to tell me, uh, there is a coup in Turkey of once a decade. And so there was a coup, I think, in 1970. There was a coup in 1980. And Mustafa Opak did get he was caught up in the coup of 1980. He was thrown in jail and he was shot. Uh, but he comes out of jail, uh, still very much uh, adhered to his politics, but his parents, his mother, his mother has said, look, I'm not going through that again with you. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can be political all you want, but you're going to have to do that. If you do that, then I can't talk to you. And so, and so he tones down the politics. He still is interested in labor stuff, but he turns his attention to, in the 1990s, to... Uh, uh, organizing for the Afro-Turks. So let's go to this last slide right here. And that says, well, you know, uh, what does Black Studies have to do with about this? Well, I think I've, I've talked a lot about what Black Studies, or, or, or I've talked a lot about, about citizenship. And, and I think that this is where the study, of, or the study of uh, Black Studies as a discipline, I think that that can really help uh, explore these ideas, not just who is a citizenship, but explore things like uh, education, why there's, why there's a link between poverty and education, and talk about immigration. Uh, 
there is an intellectual framework that helps us think about empire and slavery. And, and I'm thinking that there are people like W.E.B. Du Bois, but mostly people like James Baldwin, who uh, specifically James Baldwin had a great deal of contact with Turkey, spent I think on and off about 10 years in Turkey and, and wrote one of his books, Another Country, while he was in Turkey. And, and it's something that, um, it's something that black, black studies I think can offer a particular language. And for example, uh, this image right here, this is an image that I took of Fatna. Fatna, this is in 2014. Fatna is demonstrating for me what it's like to pick cotton. And I thought to myself, what are you talking about? <laughs> you were picking cotton in Turkey in what? In 1980s? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's what we did. Afro-Turks, uh, uh, if you didn't get a lot of education and you had to support your family, girls and boys, had to go into the cotton fields and, or they, they, they picked uh, fruit, they picked tomatoes, they picked cotton. And to my American mind, I, I said, huh? I said, wait a minute. Um, so you're black and you're chopping cotton in Turkey? Uh, and she said, yeah. And she said that um, what she's demonstrating there is that she hated picking cotton in the morning because uh, the morning dew would still be on the cotton flower and that would, and the morning, the water would make her skin soft. And if you know anything about picking cotton, cotton is a thorny plant. And you gotta, when you pick it, you gotta reach into the plant and yank out the flower. And that means that her hands are constantly being cut by the thorns. And I thought, that's, that's amazing that I think that at, at some point, at that point, I thought to myself, uh, we have to write, I have to write the, uh, some type of world history of cotton because I couldn't believe that. But what I do know and I do understand is that the, 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 the discipline of black studies can help to talk about what it means to give your labor up for an empire, but not be granted citizenship in return. And, and that is, um, that is something that we're still we're still working with right now. Um, I think well, I, I'm coming up on 45 minutes, so I'm gonna just go to my last slide and say that uh, what gives what gives this memoir uh, the power? Uh, what makes it so important? What it gives this the what it has the power to change the way that we think about slavery in the Middle East and the Near East and and it gives us the power to talk about Africa in a different way. Um, when I think one of the things that Afro-Turks really are troubled by that makes them most angry is that people, when people talk to them, uh, come up to them, they, the, the assumption is that they've only been in Turkey for 10 or 15 years, that they are recent migrants. And, and they say, no, 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 no. My family has been here for at least a hundred years. My, the descendants of my family have been here for at least a hundred years. Then they hear assumptions about Africa as being corrupt and uncivilized. They hear assumptions about migrants and how migrants are stealing jobs away from Turkish people. And one of the and and I think that the tool of black studies, a black studies gives us tools to talk about things like racial discrimination and talk about things like microaggressions. Um, Behan, Behan told me that racism is not open It's, it's uh, in Turkey. In fact, they're, they're, people are even reluctant to call it racism. Racism is considered an American problem. Uh, but racism is practiced in secret. Uh, there's never been sort of a civil rights movement because the, in Turkey because there hasn't been a need for that. But there's a sense that, because there's never been a, a Jim Crow, but there's a sense that the Afro-Turks are suffering more than white Turks and that there, there's a need for a language of that. So here I have for you, uh, for people who wanna uh, start this discussion, so a, a bibliography, although there are many, many works. I should tell you right here, right here is that Mustafa died in 2016. Uh, he had had prostate cancer uh, for about 10 years and he had fought it valiantly, but the prostate cancer came back. It is not the prostate cancer that killed him. He died of heart failure. 
but it was because he he just didn't want to endure any more chemotherapy and, and other stuff. So so in many ways, uh, uh, I'm I'm trying to make him proud uh, of this work. So that's my final. This is my final slide, and I'll just say this: my my the work that I am doing after this, my next project is oral history of the Afro-Turks. So here are some more. These are some more of my uh, students here. And these are the pictures that I've taken over the years. And that's going to be part of the oral history. And, um, and that's it. So this is, this is another picture of Behan. Um, I quite like this picture. And this is this woman right here, Aisha. She's being interviewed right here. Um, and she is an Afro-Turk. And this is, we're interviewing her at her house. And this is Guler and her son. Uh, so that's my next project. Uh, uh, that project is forthcoming, who knows when, but uh, hopefully in the next few years. So that's it. I'm going to, uh, yes, I'm going to take it off screen share. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to turn it over to Anne and to Julie. And I really want to thank you all uh, for, your, for your attention and for your, for your kind comments. Thank you so much.